today's video is a tutorial that I've been wanting to make for absolutely ages. It's one of my favorite topics and that is macro photography. Now, if you prefer to absorb your information and content via words instead, if you want to take this at your own pace, then I've written a blog, it's on my website and it covers the exact same content as this video here. So I'll put a link in the description. If you prefer to read and look at the images in your own time, check out my website. Now there's a lot of information about macro photography on the internet, but my aim with this video is to teach you everything you need to know about macro photography. I've got a lot of gear here. I'm gonna talk about what you should and what you shouldn't buy, the differences between all the different types of macro photography because there is a lot of information out there on the internet. It gets very confusing and there are different levels of macro photography. So let's start with the basics. If you're completely new to photography, then you might have an entry-level camera such as this. This is uh, quite an old Canon 550D, but let's just say you've got any entry-level um, DSLR or mirrorless camera. Then you'll probably notice that on the mode dial is a little flower symbol. That is the universal symbol for macro. Now, the misleading thing about this is that if you don't have a macro lens on your camera, if it comes with a kit lens, that kit lens may also have the little flower macro symbol on it. And that is a bit misleading because I wouldn't describe that as macro. I would say that's got close focusing capabilities rather than macro ability. Now, if you do invest in a genuine macro lens, this is Canon's 100 millimeter macro L series lens. Then the difference being, and it's, it's pretty much the criteria to be a true macro lens, is one-to-one -one reproduction. And quite simply, that means if you were to take a picture of a ruler, the measurements on the ruler would be exactly the same size in real life as they are on your sensor. It's almost like you're projecting this ruler straight onto your sensor. It's much simpler when you've got a full frame camera. Full frame camera with a genuine macro lens, everything is the same size in real life as it is on the sensor. Once you use a crop sensor camera, you've got to divide everything by 1.5 or 1.6, depending on your camera system. So all of a sudden you can't fit a 36 millimeter object on your sensor on this camera, but you divide it by 1.6 and you can fit a 22 millimeter object full size on your sensor. But that's not because of the lens, that's because of the size of the sensor. Now, some lenses out there claim to be macro lenses, but they're not at all. I had the Canon 24 to 105 L series lens. I've sold it and I've got the RF version instead. But the EF version clearly says on the side of it that it has macro capabilities. But if you have a look at the photograph that it recreates, nowhere near one-to-one -one reproduction. So this is where the confusion comes in. You might think you've got yourself a good macro lens. It's perfectly capable of taking lovely photographs and kind of close up but definitely not macro. Now the cheapest and easiest route into macro photography is extension tubes. Now these don't have any glass elements in them at all. These are quite simply hollow rings that uh, connect your camera's metering system. Uh, depending on which extension tubes you get, you may or you may not get autofocus, but these are relatively cheap. These are by a company called Kenko, K-E-N-K-O. There are loads of brands out there. And because this doesn't affect the optical performance, I wouldn't spend too much money on them. And these are manual focus. I'll get more into the focusing in a bit, but don't worry too much about whether you get extension tubes with focusing capabilities, because you're so close to your subject anyway, don't leave your camera to do the focusing. Uh, most extension tubes come in sets of three. The fattest one, that will get you a larger reproduction on your camera then the middle one, and then the least strength is the thinnest one, and you can combine them all. So if you want maximum strength, you put all three, and quite simply, if I wanted to turn this 16 to 35 lens into a macro lens, never done that, but it, I guess it may work, then quite simply you put the extension tubes in front of the lens, and now, <laughs> although this looks absolutely ridiculous, this lens can now focus super, super close. You could probably focus on something a few centimeters in front of the lens. That is extension tubes. This image I've borrowed from Nissi Filters website, and this is a close-up filter. This does have glass elements, and you're screwing it on front of your lens. It's kind of acting like a magnifying glass. Once again, allowing your lens to focus closer. 
I've never used one of these. I didn't buy one of these. I went from extension tubes to macro lens. I kind of skipped this, but I think a lot of people buy these as an alternative. I'd say the downside to this is if you buy a cheap one, you're buying cheap glass. Whereas extension tubes, you're not interfering with the optical quality of your image. That's based upon your lens itself. So I think this is doing a very similar job to the extension tubes. If it's my choice, I would go extension tubes. Just in case it's not obvious, if you invest in a macro lens like this, it doesn't just do macro. This is also an amazing portrait lens. Take that into consideration when you're buying this. Now, I don't know about other camera companies, but Canon have released a 35 millimeter macro, which is filming me right now. They've also released an 85 millimeter, which both of those lenses have one to two reproduction. So that's kind of half macro. And then they've also released a 100 millimeter, which has got 1.4 to one reproduction. So that's bigger than life size on the sensor pretty impressive. Now with the added confusion, which focal length macro lens should you get? Well, there are quite a few options out there. Here are my thoughts when it comes to the focal length. At the moment, I'm shooting on a 35 millimeter and it's got close focusing capabilities. I'd say it's good for product photography. Uh, most of the thumbnails that I make for my channel and the product photographs I use the 35 millimeter with. But if I were to be shooting wildlife, Anything that would be scared of a photographer, I would say the 35 mil is not the right tool for the job. Most good macro lenses are 90 millimeters to 105 millimeters. And what that means is you can just keep a good distance away from your subject. You're still getting that one-to-one -one reproduction on your sensor, but you're not having to go anywhere near your subject. So if you get something like the 100 millimeter macro, essentially what this is gonna give you is a bit of freedom and distance from your subject. If I were to use the 35 millimeter, try and photograph a butterfly, I'm gonna to have to get 30 centimeters away from the butterfly, and at which point it may fly off because it'd be scared. If you had the 100 millimeter, you could probably extend that to about a meter away, maybe. I mean, you're just, with a longer focal length, you don't think about it as magnification, it's working distance. The longer the macro lens you have, the more distance between you and your subject, which is gonna increase the chances of you getting a good wildlife photograph. Now, if you're in the Nikon ecosystem, they've got a 200 millimeter macro, which is pretty special. I wish they would make one for Sony or Canon. I don't think they do yet. And also take into consideration, if you had a crop sensor camera, then that's going to give you more working distance again because essentially you're zooming in by 1.5 or 1.6, still getting that one-to-one -one reproduction if you're using a genuine macro lens. I've got one caveat to that. This 100 millimeter macro is designed for a full frame camera. It performs better on a full frame camera. When I've put this on a crop sensor Canon before, uh, I had a 7D and an 80D. Sometimes I felt like I was better off taking the shot on a full frame camera and cropping in and getting a better image that way rather than using a crop sensor camera which the lens is not designed for and therefore it's not performing at its best so just take that into consideration sometimes you might be better off cropping from a full frame shot versus using a crop sensor camera because these lenses are designed for a full frame camera <laughs> When it comes to stabilization, most good macro lenses have it. And there's a reason for that because essentially macro photography is like using a very long lens. The minutest of movements exaggerates everything because you might be holding it, photographing a very small insect and you move just a little bit and then all of a sudden that insect is no longer in the frame. It's the same as if you had a 600 millimeter lens, you're photographing a lion and you just move it a smidge the line's not in your shot anymore. It's exactly the same with macro photography. So that's why stabilization is gonna help you out a lot because even the slightest of movements is just exaggerated. So most of the time you just need to kind of generate this stance for macro photography. You've got to tuck your elbows into your chest and then you're using kind of as many points in your body to get a stable shot as possible. You can obviously, if your subject is still put your camera on a tripod. That's the ideal situation. But if like me, you're chasing the, uh, the subject, then tripod's gonna slow you down. You're gonna miss the opportunity. So my advice is therefore, definitely get a macro lens with stabilization. You will not regret it.
Now, should you get an autofocus or a manual focus macro lens? Now, if you're purely using it for macro, I'd say you could definitely get away with manual focus. And that's because if you're working close up to subjects all the time anyway, you probably don't want to rely upon your camera to do the focusing because most of the time you'll probably want to focus on the eye of your subject, which is closer to the camera. If you're photographing a spider, they've got so many eyes, the camera's not going to know what to focus on. Now there are companies out there, such as Samyang, that make very sharp macro lenses and they are manual focus only. If you're just doing macro, I think that's absolutely fine. But if you intend on using this for shooting portraits, if you're using 100 millimeter at f2.8, you're gonna really, really want autofocus to just nail the focus on the eyes. Beyond one-to-one -one reproduction value is quite specialist. There's a company called uh, Laowa, I think that's how you say it, L-A-O-W-A, and they produce a 100 millimeter macro lens which does two-to-one reproduction, so that's twice regular macro. And then you've got this special uh, lens here by Canon. This is the MP E 65 millimeter f2.8 macro lens. That will get you one to five times regular macro. So this is very specialist. This is just macro. This is not gonna do portraits. When you get above one-to-one -one reproduction, and this goes five times, you, you get such a slither of your subject in focus. This is going to live on a tripod or a focusing rail. So you, you end up getting into very technical challenges when you get this close up. But if you are really, really going to get into specialist macro, then this might be the right tool for you. Now this is what I like to call extreme macro. And the only reason I call it that is because it's above one-to-one -one reproduction and I just needed to kind of separate it from my regular macro work. Now this is nifty if you want to do extreme macro on a budget. I went into a second-hand camera shop in Brighton and uh, I spent 28 pounds on this Canon FD, so that is before Canon Digital. So this is a Canon FD 28 millimeter and I spent 28 pounds on it, one pound for every millimeter. And quite simply, this is mounted backwards on my Canon. It's not meant to be focusing this way, but you flip it round and this is quite simply just known as reversing your lens. Now, if you take the front element of any lens, you think, well, how do I attach that to my camera? You will have to go online, get the filter thread size of the lens that you're looking to use, and then you get I've got a Canon EF adapter and then that screws into the front of the lens. Now you might think, Ben, why are you using an old lens? Surely that's not gonna be as sharp as a new lens. Well, that's a good question. Well, the problem is if you get more modern lenses, and this isn't a modern lens, but I'll use it as an example. When you take the lens off the camera, you'll see that the aperture blades relax. So if you were to mount this on your camera back to front, this is stuck at F2 and you might not want to use F2. So if you use some of the older lenses, they've got manual aperture control on the lens itself. They don't offer that on too many lenses nowadays, but in the olden days, when we were all young, the lenses had aperture control on them. Now, before you think, oh, 28 millimeter is quite wide, why didn't you get, say, a 50 millimeter? 28 millimeter reversed is stronger than a 50 millimeter reversed. So you'd need to do a bit of research around which one will work well, but the 28 has been a really good sweet spot for me. Okay, so straight out of the box, this reverse 28 millimeter gets you two to one reproduction. So I spent 28 pounds and I'm getting two to one reproduction with a prime lens. Sweet, huh? I keep on going on about it, but 28 pounds for some extreme macro kit this is one of my best purchases ever. It becomes very technically challenging, but if you put a 28 millimeter on these extension tubes, you get four to one reproduction. Now, this image is not sharp because I think I did this handheld, but I'm just showing you the magnification you can achieve with about 50 pounds worth of gear, extension tubes, reversed old lens. If you want to get really, really close, you can do it on a budget, but take into consideration, there is no focusing on this. You've got a lens back to front, the camera and the lens are not talking to one another. There's no EXIF data, there's no talking.
Let's talk about settings. Now there are some good rules of thumb. Uh, this is for any type of photography. If you've got a 100 millimeter lens, then the rule of thumb is that your shutter speed should be a minimum of one 100th of a second. And even if that lens has got a stabilization, I would still stick to that rule of thumb. If you're shooting macro, let's just say your subjects are quite small and you are close to your subject, then you should be shooting at an aperture of around f8, f11, that's gonna be the sweet spot. That's where most lenses perform really well. Some of them, I'll take that back, some of the newer lenses will perform really well wide open. However, in macro photography, you don't want to be shooting a small subject close up at f2.8 because only a slither of your subject will be in focus. So ideally, you're at a mid aperture, it's gonna get you optimum uh, lens sharpness and it's gonna get you a, a bit more depth of field. Now don't be tempted to start stopping your aperture down to f16 or f22, whatever your lens will allow you to, because then you're gonna get into something called diffraction. And quite simply, rather than your images getting sharper, they start to get softer. Because the aperture blades are closing down so much, the, the direction of the light and the way it works, I won't get too technical into it, but you should stick to f8 to f11, depending on your lens, that's a safe spot for you to be taking photographs. Here are my ideal settings. I would like a shutter speed of 1 200th of a second. Even if I do have stabilization and a 100 millimeter macro lens, I would still aim for 200. I would have an aperture of between F8 and F11, and then I would change my ISO to suit the subject and the lighting conditions. Now, if that is going to result in a really, really high ISO and a very grainy image, then I would introduce artificial light. But without introducing artificial light, the easiest way is to go outside on an overcast day and photograph wildlife and small subjects. Then if it's a very sunny, harsh day, then I would recommend taking a diffuser with you. One of these folding pop out uh, reflectors that have the diffuser inside, they're about five or 10 pounds on Amazon or eBay. So you put that diffuser in between your subject and the sun without scaring your subject away. And that way you're gonna get lovely soft diffuse light. Now, how much of your subject should be in focus? Well, as much as you want. It depends on your subject, really. If you take this water droplet, for example, there's no real focal point, but there's detail inside the water bubble. Um, in an ideal situation, you would do focus stacking. Now, quite simply, that is taking multiple photographs at different focus points, focus planes, and then blending them in software afterwards. But this, uh, this water droplet was genuinely freezing whilst I was taking a photograph of it. So if you did that over the course of, say, two minutes, then it may be a different photograph by the time you've finished. So that focus stacking is not always uh, available. I don't often take macro photographs on a tripod either. So in order to focus stack, you've got a few options. You can put your camera on a tripod, and if you've got a new camera, some new cameras allow you to focus stack in camera. So if you have a Canon R6 or an R5, you go into the menus and say, I would like to take 50 photographs from here to here and then you just press go and it'll do it for you. And then you can just stack them all in software afterwards. I don't have that camera, so I would have to manually do it either by manually focusing the lens or getting a focus rail, which actually moves the camera a smidge. <laughs> a smidge being a millimeter, half a millimeter, however much you want to. They are the options, but this image here is just one photograph. Sometimes you can get away with just one photograph, depending on distance to your subject, the size of your subject, settings, etc. A lot of my macro photographs are single images. But if you're photographing an animal which has got eyes, it's important that you nail the focus on the eyes because that is where the viewer will automatically look. Other camera brands, I've written down Olympus and Panasonic, they will actually stack all the images in camera for you. So I think my camera brand needs to catch up a bit. Now the tricky thing about focus stacking is when you focus on an object in the foreground, this background object will be larger. Out of focus areas become larger. And then as you focus on this, this will become larger. So the software has to change the scale of the out of focus areas, otherwise you get halos. So not all software for focus stacking is created equally. Photoshop does have built-in stacking software, but if you really get into it, you might want to get some dedicated focus stacking software. And uh, focus rails there, another rabbit hole that you can go down, you can get manual ones and you can get automated ones. Depending on how much functionality and how much money you want to throw at this hobby of yours, I think I would opt for a camera that has focus stacking 
tracking built in over automated focusing rails because they're expensive as well. Now when it comes to lighting, the science of light is working in your favor because the quality of light is relative to the size of the light source and your subject. Now this spider here measures one to two millimeters and therefore the size of a light source coming from even the tiniest of torches is a big light source relative to the subject. Therefore, it's quite easy to get good quality light when it comes to macro photography. You don't need a big softbox. But as I was saying earlier, if you are on an overcast day, that will be easy macro photography. If you are creating your own artificial light, then a small softbox will appear to be a large light source on a small subject. Now, years and years and years ago, when I was getting interested in extreme macro photography, I started following a guy called Thomas Shahan. I think that's how you say his name. I'll put a link in the description to his social media. And I was so pleased to see that he was using the most basic photography equipment. He had an old DSLR, a reverse lens, and he had a flash with toilet paper wrapped around it as a diffuser and some sellotape. It was literally just a photographer's dream to see the quality of his images and then behind the scenes of the gear that he was using. So um, I think he's upgraded nowadays. He's using better equipment. But if you have a look at his images, the images was come from him trying really hard. It wasn't the equipment that he was using whatsoever. So that's, that's reassuring. Now one thing, if you're using artificial light, like this spider, you can see the catch lights in. Spiders have got a lot of eyes, okay? So normally if you're photographing a person, you get catch lights in both of their eyes. You can see here from the catch lights in the spider's four eyes that are facing us, that I was using a rectangular softbox to light it. Now you might be tempted by one of the ring flashes that you get. Uh, I had one, I sold it, I wasn't a massive fan of it, but essentially the ring light goes around your lens and therefore you're kind of getting a 360 illumination, which is good if you're trying to remove shadows. Okay, um, you, you, if you ever watch CSI, then you'll see them using a ring light because they're photographing things as evidence. They're trying to remove the shadows. They're not trying to create art. If you're looking at a macro ring flash, you'll get something very similar, but also the catch lights in your subject's eyes will be circular. And I think it's very distracting. So I would personally avoid a ring flash. And although you might not like spiders, if you treat this as a subject, then you don't want to blast them with light from the front. You'd ideally light them from the side, gives them a bit of three dimensionality, a bit of contour. Okay, so this is my contraption of a flash. Now it looks pretty outrageous, but this piece of paper here in one of the plastic sleeves is simply a diffuser. This takes four AA batteries, and this goes on the hot shoe of your camera. It is quite front heavy. You've got these flexible arms here and you can independently control the left and the right hand side. That's good for creating some three dimensionality to your subject. And this on the front here is a focusing light. I'll tell you why the focusing light is helpful because you may already know this, but when you're using a regular lens on your camera, this lens will stay open at f2.8 so that the camera can focus on your subject. And when you look through the viewfinder on your camera, you're looking at it at f2.8. And if your camera is set to f11, when you press the shutter, it closes the aperture to f11 and then goes back to 2.8. Now, we don't have that luxury when you're doing extreme macro photography. Imagine you're looking through this lens. This is the reverse 28 mil. It's at f11 all the time. It's not opening to 2.8 and then closing down. So when you look through the optical viewfinder of this, everything is very dark. You don't actually see your subject until the flash goes off. So having a focus light on here actually allows you to see your subject and focus. So this, this focusing light is, is really key. That's the setup. We've got a DSLR here. That goes on the hot shoe and it's as simple as that. So my settings that I gave you earlier still work with this. You've got to be careful of your flash sync speed, which means that you can't do crazy high um, shutter speeds when you're using flash. So one two hundredth of a second works with my camera. So essentially what I do is I dial in my settings to correctly expose the subject here and then I just leave it alone. And then what I'll do is I'll be looking through the optical viewfinder and then I'll move the camera back and forth until my subject is in focus and then I'll take the shot. Now that you know the ropes, what should you be photographing? Well, popular subjects, you've got flowers, uh, you've got insects like butterflies, bumblebees, uh, you've got 
bubbles uh, one of my most popular searches on my website has been bubbles because about five years ago I made a tutorial on how to photograph uh, the rainbow surface of a bubble and it's still the most searched thing for on my website no matter how hard I try with everything else people are still finding my website from bubbles so there you go if you want lots of traffic coming to your website make a tutorial on how to photograph bubbles. So they're all good subjects when you're talking about one-to-one -one reproduction. Beyond that, then you're talking about, say, jumping spiders. They are literally one or two millimeters. You've got single droplets of water or really intricate details of flowers. And then when winter comes along, you can obviously photograph uh, frozen water droplets, but the dream is a snowflake, really. If you've, but you've got to nail your technique so that when a snowflake lands on you, you know exactly what you need to do to capture that. There's a guy called Dom Komarechka that I follow and I bought his ebook, it's called Sky Crystals and it's all about extreme macro photography and how to photograph and edit snowflakes. So if that is something you want to do, Dom Komarechka, I'll put a link in the description to his website and his book. But I warn you, macro photography, once you start looking through the lens of a 100 millimeter macro and you see everything close up, there's a whole world of undiscovered things that you haven't taken a photograph of. Well, there you go. That is everything that I know about macro photography. And now that knowledge is yours. So I want you to go out there and create some art with it. If I talked a bit too fast, then check out the blog on my website because all of the content is there. If you've got any questions though, let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and I'll see you in the next video.